בעזרת השם, נעשה ונצליח. I'd like to welcome you to the Lighthouse Project as we continue the series of spiritual preparation for Shavuot. We are in the middle of uh, spiritual and character refinement as we uh, are in this little spiritual envelope between Pesach and Shavuot where we're working on our Midot. As we're inching towards the big day of Shavuot, the day of Matan Torah. Before we get started on our lesson, I'd like to give an honorable mention to our Yisachar and Zevulun sponsors. We have the, jo- uh, the Dornbush family doing this in honor of their grandfather. Be'ezat uh, Hashem, the Dornbush family have a lot of Hatzlacha, Bechom Ha'asehdehem. Also, that their brand new granddaughter and the daughter of Shayna Badina will grow up to do uh, to be a, a tzaddiket of Torah, mitzvot, maasim tovim, and that they shall merit to see her in her chupa. And Bezat Hashem soon, psorot tovot, the chupa of Yosef Dombush. Also, to a righteous lady from the East Coast, a good friend, Esther Stacy Buton doing this in honor of her three sons. Be'ezat Hashem, that she have a big spiritual elevation, her and her family, and she have a big atzlacha b'chom ha'se'adeha, and go ma'ala ma'ala b'ruchaniyut v'bagashmiyut. Also like to give an honorable mention to the success of my parents and my pregnant wife. Let's get started. Please like and share the class, spread the Torah, You don't know when a little bit, a little nugget of Torah can change somebody's life for the better. As we continue this journey, we see that there's something very, very interesting. Pesach started, we were rough around the edges. Once Shavuot comes around, if you put in the work, you should feel different. You should feel like a different person. And... We've been going at it every single week, and if you think about it, there have been several layers to our spiritual and character refinement. Every week we added another layer and another layer, another concept, another idea, another Torah uh, um, angle on how we could improve our character and how we can improve the relationships between Adam Lechavero and between Adam Lamakom. And we had these several layers where right after Pesach, the first layer is the Omer, the counting. The counting of the Omer, 49 days, which we know by now that it's not just counting, putting an X on the calendar, where you're just counting down 50 days, but it's also connected to the Sefirot, the Ten Emanations, the ones that where there's three on top and seven on the bottom, and we're the ones that are dealing with the seven Sefirot. And instead of using a fancy word of sefirot, we know that each sefirah is a character. Each one is a different type of character we're working on. Chesed was the first week, benevolence. Gevurah, which was uh, strict judgments. Uh, Tiferet, which was the combination. Then Netzach and Hod. Uh, and Yesod, which is the week that we're in right now. So we're working on our character according to the sefirot. We moved on. Every single week, Parashat Shavua had very interesting concepts. Every single week there was a, a concept that had to do with a person bettering his midot. All these concepts that we discussed could have come on any other time. They could have come on any other time of the year, any different parashiyah, the parashah of the year. But it happens to be that during these seven weeks, very intense subjects, very intense subject matters that have to do ben adam lechavero. And even more so, ben adam lamakom, which we'll see soon. We also added another layer, the layer of Pirkei Avot, the ethics of our fathers, where every week we had tons and tons uh, of, of, of immense information. We had the, the, um, the Mishnayot that were able to allow us to get a peek into what Jewish life should be, what should be our morals, what should be our... Uh, uh, our guiding light when we're going through this uh, process of spiritual and character refinement. Musar, giving from 
huge Tanaic rabbis. And in the midst of this entire Sfirat HaOmer, we have a little bit of it in Nisan, a little bit of it, of it is in Sivan, but the bulk of this uh, spiritual and character work that we're doing happens in Iyar, the month of Iyar. And what do we know, what do we know about Iyar? Iyar stands for Ani Hashem Rufecha Aleph Yud Resh, Ani Hashem Rufecha. I am God, I am your doctor, I am your healer. And the reason why Iyar is the month that we, the bulk of the Omer is in is because it has the energy to heal. It has the energy to repair. So a bulk of the Omer happens in the best month possible, on the month of healing, on the month of repair. In between, in between Nisan, Iyar, and Sivan, we also have a Tchachut, a renewal that we get with Birkat Levana. That's another time that when we're blessing on the Levana, that we also have, we always say, Veruach Nachon Chadesh Bekirbi. We tell Hashem, please renew me with a new soul this month. Renew me, a new attitude, a new, a, a, a new approach to Avodat Hashem. And another layer to the journey is the story of Rabbi Akiva's students. 24,000 students perish in a matter of 33 days. Six, six, 600 to 700 students a day, dying, dropping dead, 700 funerals every day, if you could imagine. Reason that was given, that each one didn't give a proper respect to one another. How could it be? How could it be? We're still wrestling with that idea. How could it be that these spiritual giants, these, these Torah scholars, didn't give the proper respect to one another? And we went into the detail of how we could learn that. And tonight we'll have a different chidush, a different way to understand why Rabbi Akiva's students perished during this time. Furthermore, all this, this entire journey, is all leading us into one day. This is all a preparation for one huge spiritual prime time event. Matan Torah in Shavuot. And this entire journey gets cut up into two subject matters, two different approaches, two pathways. Ben Adam lechaviro, the relationship between man and man. Ben Adam lamakom, the relationship between man and God. So here we are on the final stretch. There's practically less than 10 days left to Shavuot. As we have been preparing ourselves, and even more so tonight, creating a bigger vessel, a larger vessel for more kedushah to come in during Shavuot. Because we said you can roll into Shavuot two ways. It could be just like a great day for you to uh, look forward to the baked ziti and to the cheese burekas that everybody makes, or you work on yourself for 49 days, and what happens? You get you show up to cup with a to God with a full cup like this. It's like well, you formed a beautiful vessel. And you tell Hashem, please fill me up. Fill me up with Kedushah. I want to get holier. I want to get more spiritual. Fill me up for now and for the upcoming year. So it all depends on how you prepare for it. But since we last saw each other, we missed out on one very important highlight of this uh, 49-day journey, which was the, the main event of last week, which was Lag Baomer. Now, you know that we've been counting the Omer. We've been counting every day. Lag Baomer, as we know, is the 33rd day of the Omer. What's the day right before that? Lev Baomer. What's Lev Baomer? 32. What's the word lev in Hebrew? Heart. So, right before Lag Baomer, the word lev is not a surprise. Because anyone who took the time to work on himself, to work on his midot for the past 32 days, you know what happens? The heart starts to pump. That's it. Now you're feeling it. Now you're, now, now you're, you're, you're lit. 
Now you're starting to, uh, you start to feel engaged. You put in the work. It's not like someone who just comes into a lecture and the next day, ah, you know, maybe I'll be into it. If you're working on your character for 32 days, you're in it. It's like going to the gym for 30 days. You start to feel like, starting to feel swole. You start to feel a little sore. You're into it. You beat that two-week, three-week bug of talking yourself out of it. You're in the zone. Same thing. When it comes to live, the heart is awake. You're ready to go. You're already starting also to, with the heart. You're starting to feel for another Jew. So what happens? As you get to that 32nd day, the Lev of Omer, we come into this huge celebration of Lagba Omer. What's Lagba Omer? What do we do? We celebrate the fire of the Torah, the, 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 the Torah of the Sod, the Zohar, and the, and, and the author of that book, which is Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai, Zechet Tzadik Livracha. And you see we have a very interesting custom uh, interesting uh, thing that we do. We light bonfires, huge ones, and we hold hands, we hold hands, and we start to dance around it in circles. What's the significance of that? What's the, what's the source for this fire on Lagba Omer? So there's several reasons. One of the reasons is that in Lag Baomer is when the plague of Rabbi Akiva's students stopped. So every person that was mourning these 24,000 students would bring a candle, a yurtzeit candle. And eventually, since they all showed up, they all put it together and it came into a big bonfire. And ever since then, they light up like one big yurtzeit candle for all the 24,000 students. That's the bonfire. Another... Uh, Another interesting reason that I heard for the bonfire is it's because of the way fire behaves. No, I'm sorry, before I tell you that, it's because of the type of Torah that Rabbi Shimon Bar Yochai brought. He brought the Zohar. The Zohar is fire. The Zohar is the sod. The Zohar is the secret. Anyone who gets close to the Torah and learns Parashat Shavua and then moves forward to Nevi'im and then Mishnayot and then Gemarot and then all that, once you get to the Sod, once you get to the Kabbalah, it's fire. This is a very, very special learning. You have to be on a very, very high level to understand. All of us can pick up at any given time, at any, any given age, the Zohar and read it and be like, oh, I read the Zohar. Oh, you're cool now. But to really understand it, to internalize it, to even understand the concepts that are in there, you have to really be ready for it. The rabbis tell us, it's better the Zohar, you just read. Don't even try to understand it. Because what happens is when somebody reads the Zohar and they're not a proper vessel to it, all that learning goes to the other side. All that learning goes to the Sitra Achra. So as you try to get holier, you're actually pumping up the other side. It's better not to do it just to read it. So the fire represents the Torah of the Zohar. Another interesting concept is how does fire behave? If you ever notice, fire as an element always goes up. If you take a candle and you turn it upside down, which way does the flame go? Up. If you take a lighter and you turn it upside down, which way does the fire go? Always up. Why? That's the way fire behaves. So when all the Jews are holding hands together, feeling united, they just worked on themselves for 32 days, Ben Adam they're feeling so close, they have the fire inside of them, they have the desire inside of them, they're all united holding hands and they say, Hashem, we're fire, and all we want to do is we want to come up to you. We want to come up and connect to you. Just like the fire is going up to the heavens, so do we. The following day is Lamed, De Lamed Dalet Ba'omer. Lamed Dalet Ba'omer, that's already when the Sephardic Jews start to shave their beard, they get haircuts, we shed away this mourning that we've been doing. And who, what were we mourning? We weren't mourning the death of those 24,000 students, we were mourning the death of the Torah that we lost from those 24,000 students. That's what we did. We don't even know what the names of these rabbis were. Imagine. Yet the rabbis tell us, if they were part of the Jewish lineage, if they continued to live, it would be a completely different nation. Imagine if we had an influx of 24,000 huge 
Torah scholars. Imagine their children, their schools, their daughters, their families. What, what would we be? A completely different nation. But again, we're not mourning them. We're mourning the Torah that we lost. And right after all that, after we go through this very intense Lamed Bet, Lamed Gimel, Lamed Dalet, where we see there's like a change of energy. People feel a little bit different after that. We get to the 35th day of the Omer, also known as Lamed Hey. And what's Lamed Hey? Lashem. This means now that we've hit a crossroad in our journey of the Omer. That we've been, been, we've been on Ben Adam Lechavero, and we're on fire, we're good, the heart is pumping, we've been working on the Midot. Hashem says, you know what, now it's time to work on the second part of Lamed Hey, Lashem. Now let's work on Ben Adam Lamakom. What is the right relationship between a human being and God? Because up until now we're doing between man and man. And ironically, on the week of Lamed Hay, we have the Parashat Emor. Parashat Emor had a lot of different concepts in it. One of them was the man that cursed God, the Megadef. So on the week that we're supposed to be Lashem, that we're supposed to be getting closer on the, or working on the relationship between man and God, you open up the Chumash, there's a guy over there that's cursing God. Not to go too much into that story, and turn this into a Parashat Shavua class, but you can see that a human being can sometimes get to the point where he can curse God. That the relationship can be so off with his Creator, that he gets to the point that he has no understanding, no connection with God, that he can actually feel that it's all wrong, and the reason for it, for it all being wrong is the Creator Himself. The one who gives him life is the one that he's cursing. And that's that week of Lamed He Baomer. And you say to yourself, wow, we're starting really from the bottom. A lot of work. If we're, if we're starting from that point, that means by the time we finish this whole process in about 15 or 16 days from now, I wonder what my relationship with God is going to be. As a matter of fact, there's a journey. Just pay attention. Just pick up your spiritual antenna and pick up everything that's going on. You can see the story. Or you can just be oblivious to it. Even the parashiot of the that has been going on, if you remember, we had uh, the past few weeks we had achre mot kedoshim. Remember, a few weeks ago the parashiot of the shavua were after the death of the holy. Achre mot is one parasha. Another parasha is called kedoshim. If you put it together, achre mot kedoshim after the death of the holy, and we know who who died, who was holy and died. So. We had Nadav and Avihu that tried to serve Hashem in their own way. Not in the right way, not in the proper path, not the way that they were supposed to. They, they were on such a high level. Again, the rabbis tell us that you don't even know what kind of a nation we would be if a Nadav and Avihu were a continuation of the leadership of Am Yisrael after Moshe and Aharon. And they said, we have a different way. We have a new way of serving God. Our way is a new way. It's love. It's happiness. It's closeness. We're going we're gonna to fix everybody. If they go into, into the Mishkan with the Ketoret on its inauguration day, before the first sacrifice is brought on the altar, they get zapped right in the Mishkan. What did they do? They didn't have the, the proper uh, foundation. They created their own way, their own religion, their own way of serving. They didn't follow the proper guidelines given. They didn't follow instructions. They didn't even ask for advice, not from their rabbi, not from their father. They just did their own way. And we learned from that, the whole, people on such a holy level did it the wrong way. Learn from that. Also, who were the other Kedoshim? The 24,000 students of Rabbi Akiva. Don't forget, during this time period, they died also. Learn from them. And then we come into the next few parashiyot, which are Behar Bechukotai. What's Behar Bechukotai? Where are we meeting God in a couple of weeks? 
We have a date. We have a date with God. Where is it? He tells me, we have a rendezvous, meet me by a mountain. Har Sinai, Behar, meet me over there. And when you meet me over there, what it's going to be? Bechukotai. I'm going to give you all the, all the perfect ways to serve me and the way to be a success. Bechukotai, all my chukim. You see, even the title, the, the names of the parashiot are a whole story within their, on their own. So, as we're inching towards that mountain, as we're waiting for God to speak to us and give us His, his laws, his, his book of success, it's like, imagine, you go into a place and there's this guru, he's going to tell you the secret to life. I'm going to fix everything for you. Oh, you'd stay in online and you'd, and you'd pay top dollar and you'd, you'd do anything because he's figured it out. God said, I'm the ultimate guru. I'll, do, I'll, I'll give it to you from the get-go. He gave us the, the book of success, the Torah. So, as we continue our journey of this 49 days between Pesach and Shavuot, this week's parasha, as we're again, Behar Bechukotai, Another interesting subject. Let's see what we could learn from this week's parasha about this journey that we're on. And keep in mind, this is the part where it's between man and God. The concepts have changed a little bit. Up until now, we were talking about a lot of different concepts between man and man. This week, it's going to be a little bit different. Now you're going to see God coming into the picture. I mean, God is always in the picture. But right now, it's a little bit more clear. This week's parasha, we're privy to the secret of the number seven. There's, there's a big secret in the world, in existence. There's a big secret in the formula that the way this world has been created, and the number seven is a big part of it. The number seven is found in many different places. In this week's parasha, it's brought up in the concept of Shemitah. I'll read you a, 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 one pasuk where it says, V'safarta lecha sheva shabbatot shanim, sheva shanim, sheva pe'amim, v'hayu lecha yeme sheva shabbatot ashanim, tesha v'arbaim shana. It's telling us, count seven weeks, and count seven years, and then count it seven times. And should be just like we're counting 49 days for the Omer, got to count 47 years for the, as we count weeks. He says also count years. Count the weeks for the Omer, count the weeks for the Shemitah. And, and as we're counting 49 days of Shavuot, until we reach Shavuot, count 49 years for the Yovel, for the Jubilee. And as we're learning this concept of how uh, a farmer should work the land for six years and rest on the seventh. And he should do that for seven cycles and on the 50th, he's got one big year where everybody goes free. Oh, everybody gets out of debt for free. Everybody gets out of slavery for free. Everybody gets their properties back. Free. Everybody goes free in the Jubilee. And we're learning this concept and we're trying to see, well, how does that connect to me? What am I supposed to learn from Shemitah and the Yovel on the spiritual and character refinement journey that I'm on. Well, you should know that the world was created in six days. And that's the mundane. That's the world. Then Hashem infused spirituality into the world with an additional day. The day of Shabbat. The seventh day. So there's a concept of mundane, that's six, and then there's seven, that's holy. Seven, six is regular, seven makes it spiritual. In other words, every time that you see the number seven, every time that you see the number seven, you should know that it has something to do with spirituality. We have seven days of the week. We have seven colors of the rainbow. We have seven musical chords. We have seven worlds and seven heavens. 
we have seven weeks of the Omer. We have seven years of the Shemitah. And inside the Chumash, if you ever study this in depth, there are hundreds, hundreds of examples of certain words, certain concepts, certain ideas that were repeated exactly seven times. And each one we can go off into a tangent and explain it. So why are colors appealing? Because there are seven colors. Hashem puts spirituality into the colors. Why are there seven chords in music? Because Hashem infused spirituality into the music. That's why it's so appealing. Whenever you put some spirituality into something, it becomes appealing. These are all things that are part of our life, and we don't know why my favorite color is green. And I don't know why my favorite chord or my favorite music is, is this or is, is, as opposed to that. Because there's some sort of beauty in it. And the beauty comes with the seven that's instilled in it. Seven means that spirituality has been infused. Now, you should know that there's a cyclical pattern to the world. If you've ever been in a relationship or in a marriage you'll see that most marriages on the seventh year, they start to go through something. They always have to, it's like, easy, like something has to, has to give. Sometimes they get into a huge fight, or sometimes they just grow and flourish into the next level. The world works on seven-year cycles. Businesses, trends, real estate, stock market, there have been many, many people that have been trying to actually crack the code in many different markets through this. There's another secret of, the, of Pi, of the signal Pi and the 3.45 and all that. It's another deep secret over there, all from, all from Judaism. Now, what is... What is the Shemitah? The Shemitah is basically you work for six years and you stop. And you press reset. The ground needs to relax. It needs a one year break. And at that same time, the instruction for the farmer is to, for one year to go to the yeshiva and go learn. So imagine this guy is working nonstop. He wakes up at five o'clock in the morning. He work, he's working, the, he's working the, the ground and the dirt and he's smelling it and he's watering it and he's putting in a seed and he's waiting for it to bud and it turns into a trunk and then into a tree and fruit and he's waiting for the weather, he's waiting for the rain. I mean, he's heavily involved in agriculture or that agricultural life and that you're very connected to it. You're very connected. Ask farmers. Farmers are married to their land and you ask that guy after six years stop you can't even go onto your field as a matter of fact anybody who wants to go on your field can go and can take and can cut and can have you can't go you check yourself into a yeshiva and learn why? well one reason is don't lose focus you didn't come here to grow tomatoes for a, li for, for a living you didn't come here so you can be the best orange grove in the land. A Jew's purpose in this life is his tikkun, his spirituality, his neshama. We are the people of the book. God gave us the Torah, mitzvot, and ma'asim tovim. That's what you need to busy yourself with. However, the world runs where we need food, we need parnasa, we need money. So he says, we need a balance. So before you go off after six years and just telling me, I can't, Abba. Abba in the Shemaim, I can't. I got to wake up at five in the morning to work the land. And I get home at eight o'clock and I'm pooped. I don't have time for anything. He says, no problem. I'll give me a year in the shtibel. Why? Because you need a spiritual recharge. The land needs to recharge and you need to recharge. We also have a different type of reset. We have a weekly reset. What's the seventh day? Shabbat. Hashem says, don't wait six years. After six days you need to stop. 
After six days, you need to stop from your hustle and bustle and press reset and recharge. And ironically, it's, it's very interesting between the, the religious Jew and the secular Jew. So the secular Jew or the goyim, what do they think? You work hard, you put in the time, you put in the effort, you'll make the money. Let's take an example. We have a guy just opened up a store in the mall. And the guy comes and says, you know what? I'm going to start being a good Jew. Then, okay, first thing you do is you close your store on Shabbat. Close my store on Shabbat? It's the weekend. Yeah, you got to close. It's the weekend. That's the, that, that, that's the, the bulk of my business is the weekend. Not only that... I have to work extra hours. I have to stay there till 10. I have to work on the weekends. I, I have to work. If I don't work, I don't make money. What's God's formula to making money? You gotta love God. God says, if you want to see success during the week, if you want to make money on Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, it comes from one place. The source of all the blessings, the source of all the parnasa comes from one place. Where is it? Can I GPS it? Is it on a map? Where is it? The parnasa comes from Shabbat. Shabbat. So, the way you keep Shabbat is the way Shabbat keeps you. So, Hashem says, if you want to make money, first, take a day off. Secondly, enjoy yourself. Eat the best foods. Thirdly, go to shul, study, learn, pray, sing. And the more you are happy on that day, the more you are involved in happiness and joy in the, on this Shabbat day, the more successful you're going to be during the six days. Imagine, as a Jew... You take one day off, you have the best time ever, and then the rest of the week, it's all taken care of. Because the Pasuk says, Sheshet Yamim Te'asemelacha. Six days, the work will be done for you. They say, How can it be, will be done? Meaning, I will do, or I need to do. What do you mean, Te'asemelacha? Te'ase, because the way you keep Shabbat, the work is going to get done for you. Two different ways of thinking of how to make money. Small little story of a friend of mine. They used to have a store in Key West. Key West, you know, the business is really only on the weekend. It's a ghost town during the week. And he was getting closer to God. He was listening to rabbis. And let's say it, the, the Shabbat question comes into the picture. Am I keeping Shabbat or am I not keeping Shabbat? He says, I'm keeping Shabbat. He tells him, but you have to close the store. We close the store. That means what? One day of business, Sunday? How are we going to survive? He says, you know what? Hashem Yerachem. We do it. And they did it. They closed the store on Shabbat. And it was weird and it felt like they didn't know. One week they're making money, one week they're not making money. What's going to be? But you know, that's the test of the beginning. You don't close on Shabbat and on Sunday you make a million dollars. It doesn't work like that. There's a test. Hashem is testing you. You will to see if you're real. Well, they kept at it. Hashem, Baruch Hashem didn't keep him too long. On the fourth week, they started to feel the bracha. On the fourth week, they come in on a Sunday and they made more money than they ever made on a weekend combined times four. They couldn't believe it. They look outside, they see the competition. Same store, same goods across the street. The guy is smoking two packs of cigarettes outside and they're rocking and rolling. Fast forward, next week, Sunday was average, but Tuesday was bananas. Tuesday, they never made business on Tuesday. Hashem sent the bracha on Tuesday. And so on and so on and so on. And later on, you know, people talk between stores and they see that the guy with opening Shabbat, 8 in the morning till 2 o'clock in the morning, didn't touch the register of a Tuesday on those that kept Shabbat. Shabbat yi mekura bracha. We stop on Shabbat to infuse ourselves back with spirituality. 
And the way that we infuse ourselves with spirituality is what gives power to the mundane the next six days. So we have the weekly reset, which is Shabbat. Then we have the yearly reset, which is the Shemitah. And then we have the seven times seven, that's the Jubilee, that's the Yovel, that 50 year reset. It's like a master reset. But something that was very interesting something that's very interesting is that Adam, a human being, where do we come from? We come from the earth. Adam comes from the Adama. Why? Why is that Adam called Adam? Because he comes from the Adama. Right? So listen to this. What is the purpose of earth? Earth, or the ground, its function really is to make things grow. You put a seed inside, it nourishes it with whatever it has inside. All of a sudden, grass, flowers, trees, fruits. The earth's character is to grow. So Adam that was taken from the Adama, what's his purpose? To grow. That's why he's called Adam. It's in his name. A person is called Adam because his purpose is to grow in life. So we see over here that Adam and Adama have a similar thing. The land needs to rest and the man needs to rest. This is a, something interesting. If you take Shabbat, how many Shabbats do we have a year? 52. How many Shabbats do we have in seven years? So 52 times 7, I'll do it for you, it's 364. 364 is the equivalent of one year's worth that the land rests. So the land rests one year, 364. The human being rests every Shabbat. 364 Shabbatot he rests, that's his Shemitah. Why? Because Adam and Adama, they have to both rest. As a matter of fact, the gematria, the numerical value of the word Shemitah, 364. Chidush. They say, there's a pasuk, we say it on Shabbat, it's a pasuk in Tehillim. Let me see if I can find it quickly. I found it. It says, in Tehillim, Perek Tzadik, Yeme Shenotenu Vahem Shivim Shana. He says, the la- uh, this is uh, David HaMelech. He says, the average lifespan of a human being is 70 years. And if he's really strong and he's really like out there fighting the fight for life, he'll make it to 80. And most of it is work and, 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 and uh, nonsense. And it feels like what? Like a vapor in the wind. That if you ever look at a person's life, on the, on the larger scale, you know, if you take the, the world, uh, the 5,778 years that we hear, or overall the billions of years that we hear, what's 70 years? It's like a, and it's gone. In comparison. So he says, What's 70 years? They say that a person becomes a bar mitzvah at 13. Right? And at 13 till 20, which is a total of how many? Seven. There's that seven again. He doesn't get judged or he doesn't get punished for his sins. A man gets, starts to get punished for his sins at the age of 20. Between 20 and 70, what do we have? 50 years. Again, the seven, seven. There's a whole secret to the cycle of seven in our lives. We're living it. We just don't know it. That's just what's in this week's parasha. And what do we learn from the seven? That we have to infuse spirituality in our life. Every seven years. Every seven days. Every moment that we need, we can't do without it. Because what happens after seven... Oh, 
what was, what was the Perk Tehillim saying? That we live until 70? Because he tells you, it's 70, you need to retire. At 70, you have to go like the Yovel. What happens the Jubilee? Everybody gets set free. He tells you after seven years, you're set free. Stop working. Time to, time to learn. You work, to, don't tell me now it's 70, you have to wake up every day and work. It's time to retire and time to learn. That's the lesson over here. That we constantly have to infuse our life with the number seven. We constantly have to infuse our life with spirituality. If you do it every six years, I'm sorry, if you do it every seven years, if you do it every 49 years, if you do it every seven days, if you do it every 49 days like we do in the Omer, infuse yourself with spirituality. It's a must. That's how you get close, Ben Adam, Lamakom. That's how you and God get close. The spirituality infused every seven, the cycle of seven. I couldn't let this lesson go without learning one Mishnah which is the title of today's class, which is the Pirkei Avot. It's a very, very special Perek. It's a very famous Perek. It's one that we say every day when we pray. It's Yehuda ben, uh, Yehuda ben Tema. Yehuda ben Tema is a big rabbi, has a lot of history. I'm not going to share um, his life story with you guys, but we are going to learn his Mishnah. Very, very interesting Mishnah. It says, Yehuda ben Tema Omer, Heve az kanamer, vekar kanesher, ratz katsevi, vegibor kaari, lason ritzon avicha sheba shamayim. In English, it's Yehuda ben Tema says, Be brazen like the leopard, light like the eagle, swift like the deer, and mighty like the lion to do the will of your father who is in the heaven. The second part of the, uh, of the Mishnah is, Hu haya Omer, he used to say, who's, who's he used to say? Yehuda ben Tema. Az panim le Gehenom, uvoshet panim le Ganayaden. He says, the brazen faced are bound to go to hell, and the shame faced are bound to go to heaven. Very interesting Mishnah. But it's perfect for the time period that we're in and for the lesson that we want to learn tonight. Let's get started. In order to understand why Yehuda, Rabbi Yehuda ben Tema is talking to us about be like a lion, be like an eagle, be like a deer. Why is he telling us to be like animals? I'm a human being. Why do I have to be like an animal? So in order to get a, 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 more, a, a, a better grasp on why he would say that, first we have to go back to Bereshit, to the first few pages of the Chumash. And it says over there, after the fifth day of creation, God turns to all the angels that are in front of him, and he says, and it's quoted in the Chumash, Vayomer Elokim, Naseh Adam betzalmenu kedmutenu. Let us make man. He says, let us make man in our image after our likeness. So I ask you, if I am the creator, do I have to ask permission from somebody? Do I tell them, let us make man, or come be my partners? Or what is your opinion? From here we learn that Hashem has derech eretz. That Hashem asks to be polite, because there's somebody in the room, there's people with him. What do you think? Hashem teaching us ben adam lechavero right there. But why would he ask the angels, let us make man? Because you have to understand that whatever is in this world is in the upper world. Whatever we have down here is up there. So for example, <clears throat> there's a ministering angel for everything on this planet. There's an angel for all the countries. Each country has an angel in the Shemaim. There's an angel for the seas. There's an angel for the trees. The Gemara says that there's not a blade of grass that doesn't grow unless its angel in the Shemaim comes down, hits it, and says, grow. Then it begins to grow. Could you imagine how many angels are in the heavens? So all these angels are ministering angels over everything that's worldly. So on the fifth day, after God created all of creation, He turned to all these angels 
that are his creations and he says let us create man each one of you donates something give me something from your character and now I'm gonna put it into a little pile and from that we're gonna create man so like that the human being the the the, the the, the top of the echelon of God's creations has all that has been created before him inside of him. So when he says, strong like a lion, because I have a lion inside of me. Be light like a deer, because I have a deer inside of me. I could take on any character. Certain people have more of one character and less of the other, you can tell. Some people have sloths in them and they're very, and they're very lazy. Some people have uh, bears in them, and you could you could also see that we have all of God's existence inside of us. So let's understand that as a ground level. Let's continue. So remember, this Mishnah is going to teach us how to serve Hashem, because right now we're in that part of Lamed Hey Lashem. That's what this lesson is about. How do we serve Hashem? How do we, how do we uh, better our relationship between Ben Adam Lamakom? Between God and man. So when it says, Heve az kanamer, Be brazen like a leopard. What does that mean? So if you know, to be brazen is to be daring. Or, sometimes is to say, to have chutzpah. Or, not to be ashamed. Or, not to be embarrassed. To be az. Azut. For example, the leopard is not the strongest animal in the jungle. But you know what? Sometimes it wins most of its wars in the jungle because of its brazenness. It doesn't give up. It doesn't stop. It keeps trying. It doesn't care what people think doesn't care what people say. So when it says, Heve az kanamer, this is favodat Hashem. You should have that type of character the way you worship God. When you walk into the room and you're the only one with the kippah and everyone around you, whether it's your family, your friends, strangers, goyim, and you have to eat or drink and you have to say, Baruch Ata Hashem, and everybody around you is looking, look at the Moshe Rabbeinu over here, and you're drinking, and you're saying, what's going to be? I'm embarrassed. Maybe I shouldn't do it. Maybe I should go behind the corner. He says, no. Don't worry. Don't let people make fun of you when you want to do Avodat Hashem. You know, there's a lot of societal pressures. Friends, families, you know, people, if you come from a religious family, it's, when it comes to being religious, it's a little easy. But if you're not religious and your family is not, and then you come into the picture all of a sudden and you want to like keep Torah Mitzvot Maasim Tovim, ooh, it's tough. You know, when I was younger, my sister was more religious than me. I would give her such a hard time. I would give her such a hard time. Oh, you're going to bless? Oh, you're trying to, you know, you're trying to be, I would, I would tease her so much. I don't even want to say it. It's very funny and childish. But I would tease her. And I, you know, as I got older, I was like, oh my God, how did she do it? How did she stay religious with all of us giving her such a hard time? Later on, when I got older, and, you know, you, you have this certain character, this certain uh, persona that you've, you've ad uh, adapted. And then all of a sudden, you come into your circle of friends, into your workplace, and all of a sudden, you're like, you don't do certain things. I, I, I don't curse anymore. I try to keep my mouth clean. What? And they're dropping S-bombs and F-bombs all over the place and you're like, I can't. Or they tell you, you know, like, need to eat. Okay, let me take out my napkin. Let me take out my kippah. Ah, they're laughing at this. Rabbi this, Rabbi that. Moshe Rabbeinu, look at this guy over here. Chacham Gamliel. You know, they give you all the names. What happens? What are you going to do? Are you going to stop because they're going to make fun of you? What do you say? Askan Amer. Who do I care? I care about God. I don't care about them. I don't care about these clowns. Ask Hanamir. He says, that's what it is. And what a reward you get when you're the shining beacon of light of Kedusha in your circle of friends. And you know what happens at the end? At the end, they, 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 they give you credit. 
חזק וברוך. You did it. You were such a far away place, and doesn't matter where you were and what people said, you did it. That's <laughs> Azkan Amel. Then he says, Vekal Kanesher, be light like an eagle. You know, eagle is one of the heaviest birds. It's one of the heaviest birds. He says, Bikal Kanesher. What's Kal Kanesher? We know that the eagle has a couple of uh, special uh, characters, uh, what was, no, special gifts. One, it flies the highest more than any other bird. Second, it has vision. The Gemara says that an eagle that was in Bavel, which is nowadays Iran or Iraq, would be able to see a dead cadaver in Jerusalem. Could you imagine what vision an eagle has? So we learn, and it flies higher than any animal. As a matter of fact, it keep, uh, uh, an eagle picks up its chicks with its feet. No, I'm sorry. It picks up uh, uh, an eagle, picks up its chicks on its back. You know why? It flies so high that it knows that the only way that they can get it with an arrow is if they ch- shoot it on the legs because it's holding its chicks. So the only way they could protect the chicks, nobody's on top of her. Nobody can fly higher than an eagle. So we learn from here that you have to be, first of all, light. What's light? Don't be heavy. Oh, it's time to pray for Minyan. Oh, I'm tired. Oh, it's time to do a mitzvah. Oh, later. Oh, it's time to, it's time to go to shul. Not right now. It's time to go to a class. Always no. It's time to become more religious. When I, when I get older, when I get married, when I become a millionaire, when I, when I retire, you become heavy. He says, no, yeah. It tells you to be light like an eagle. Kal kaneshel. In your service of God, you have to be light. And you have to have vision. You have to see ahead. You have to see ahead what you're doing. Was it good for your neshama? Or if it's not? You have to have, to have the vision of an eagle. I once heard a beautiful story from Rabbi Yeshayahu Pinto. He says, in the history of, of, in the, history of, uh, of the world, there have been a lot of different types of eagles. We, not all the eagles that we see today are the eagles that have been in existence. There have been huge eagles, the size of this room. As a matter of fact, Shlomo Melech used to have an eagle that he used to ride. Imagine, he would be on top of an eagle and he'd go to this special mountain. It's like, like, it's like fairy tale. So one time I heard the Arab Rishayah Pinto tell a story of an eagle, a special eagle that lives for 70 years. And what happens is when this eagle turns 40 it goes through something very unique you know the beak grows like a nail so what happens is at the age of 40 the beak has curved to the point that it's locking up its bottom lip to the point where it can't open up its mouth and eat so now the bird cannot eat it's just a matter of time before it dies in order for it to survive it flies very high to these uh, rocky mountains. And what it does is it breaks off its beak. It breaks off its beak on the rocks in order for it to survive. It will regrow a beak again. But right now, it has no beak. And to continue, the, the eagle continues to break its wings. It hits its wings on the rocks and breaks them. And the rabbi says that the, uh, that the eagle goes inside the mountain into a small hole and it sits there and recovers for about four and a half to five months. And after four to five months, its wings are way stronger and way longer and the beak starts to regrow again. And then it's able to live for the additional 30 years to its full 70 years. And he tells us from this we can learn a lot from an eagle. He says most human beings also reach that type of uh, breaking point at the age of 40. And they sometimes have to, they have like a midlife crisis. And what do they do? They have to do something dramatic. They have to change their life completely. They have to take upon themselves something completely different from who they are, what they are. They have to break off their wings. I'm sorry, they have to break their wings. They have to break off their beak but the rabbi says after five months, after five months, they begin 
a new life. A little story about an eagle. That's Katsvi. You run like a deer. Deer is a very interesting animal. Very skinny legs. Super fast. So we see that the animal of the Tzvi runs very fast. And on the eagle, we just learned that it's one of the fastest or the animals in the heavens. The reason why the rabbi put the Tzvi right after the eagle is to teach us that you can be on a very high level in the heavens, but you also have to be on a very high level in the ground. You have to be fast in the Shamaim for the mitzvot, and you have to be fast in the ground like the Tzvi. The last part, Gibur Kari, strong like a lion. Now, strong like a lion, we know the lion is the king of the jungle. Why didn't you tell me that the Ari should be first? You should be strong like a lion, which by the way, I don't know if anybody caught it on the, on the title of the, of the class. That's why we put the, it's actually in the Mishnah, last. Why do we put it first? I'll tell you in a minute. He says, because you have to go, you can't just become king of the jungle. Just like that. You can't come to the top right away. Be gibor ka'ari. First you have to be as kanamer. Then you have to be light like the eagle. You have to be swift like the deer. And only after you go through all these stages, then you can become gibor ka'ari. And this is all for the service of Hashem. These are all different character traits, characteristics that we need in order to get closer to HaKadosh Baruch Hu. The last part of the Mishnah, he says, as panim panim He says, the brazen face go to hell, and the, the ones that have a boshet panim, how did they explain it? Shame-faced are bound to the Garden of Eden. So, as panim, to be brazen on the inside is one thing, favodat Hashem. But if your azut, if your brazenness comes out and it's projected in your face, if you're going to have that face of azut, where you're walking around and you're haughty and, you're, and, you're, uh, and you have your pride, you're wearing your pride on your face, that type of character and attitude, there's a place for that. And they send them to hell. Boshet panim, the gentle face, the, the soft spoken, uh, the, the Torah scholar, where does it go? Le Gan Eden. In other words, even if you would just wanted to do a very basic test, how do I get to heaven? Boshet Panim. Which people make it to hell? Azut Panim. Imagine, next time when a person gets angry and he puts on that face. Imagine, you just think of this Mishnah and you could just change the way that you act. One last Chidush that I heard, and which was, uh, well this I'll conclude. Very interesting uh, Midrash that I, uh, I read from Rav Yoram Abergel Zechet Tzadik Levracham. He says, As Panim, he says, the Genom Veboshet Panim Legan Eden, he says those are two types of rabbis. There's two types of rabbis. There's a, a rabbi that you can send him to the As Panim. He says, the rabbi who's strong, who's got a, a, a very strong attitude, a very strong character, where do you send them? To Gehenom. What's Gehenom? Those are the ones that are not keeping Torah, mitzvot, ma'asim tovim, you know, the ones that are living the goyish life. That's a tough bunch. Those are tough cookies. You got to send a special type of rabbi to those guys. And then there's another type of rabbi. You know, the Torah scholar. He's good in the Bet Midrash, with the books, teaching t- students, taking care of a shul. He's a soft-spoken rabbi. Don't send him over there. He's not going to be able to get the, the, the same outcome. Boshet Panim, Gan Eden. Where's Gan Eden? The Bet Midrash, that's the Gan Eden. So we see when you have two diff- different rabbis, we're two different characters. A rabbi who's a, uh, who's a Talmid Chacham, who's a learner, who's a teacher, keep him in Bet Midrash. If you see that there's a rabbi that's a little bit rough around the edges and he knows how to handle people, the rough and tough bunch, send him over there. You got to know which rabbi. That's why it's very important to choose the right rabbi for your community. So in conclusion, let's recap the journey. We've been on a six-week journey. There's one more to go. And we've touched many different subjects. 
This is almost like a, a pat on the back for anybody who's been coming to this class. Look how many concepts we've been touching. We were talking about having a proper path to building your spirituality. A proper avenue to serving Hashem. Not like Nadav and Avihu. And not like the 24,000 students of Rabbi Akiva. In the Parashat HaShavua, we spoke about the Metzora, the person that Motzira, the evil speech, the Lashon Hara. That's not the way of the, that's not what we're looking for. That's not what Hashem wants us to be. No exclusion, inclusion. You don't, you don't uh, cause separation between one another. You have to have Achdut. Then we spoke about kosher food. And we said that you can't, uh, you can't, um, you have to take care of the body before you can take care of the soul. There's a reason why we're talking about uh, kashrut in the middle of the parashiyot, because you can't have all these Torah concepts permeate your neshama if you're eating non-kosher food. There's just there's too many barriers; it doesn't allow it. And then we continue to other concepts of uh, proper and improper human relationships. What a person can be, who he can be with, who he can marry, who he can't marry, who he can have relations with. And we said before you can have a proper relationship with God, you got to know what the proper relationship is with another human being. We spoke about igniting the fire of Torah, the fire of Teshuvah, the fire of unity like we had in Lag Baomer, that ignites our desire to connect to God. And even if you're at the level of Cursing God. You know, a lot of people that have gone through traumatic experiences with family, with children, with... Bi- a person that lost, lost all his money after 20 years of working hard. That's tough. A person who lost his uh, relatives in the Holocaust. It's tough. A person who's lost his, uh, God forbid, his children in a fire. That's tough. How do you deal with those things? A person like that can literally raise up his hands to the heavens and curse God. We, in this week's parasha, we say, we know that you can get like that, but there's a way out of it. We spoke about the secret of the number seven. The spirituality that's infused in this world and how it's necessary for every Jew. And as we go through this journey of trying to become a spiritual being, as we have this rendezvous with God on Har Sinai coming up in a week or two, we're again just forming that vessel that is going to be pure enough and big enough, has enough space to receive the Kedusha of that time, that holiday, and of that day. And all this, we learn, they have to be brazen like a leopard, light like an eagle, swift like a deer, and strong like a lion. Lion is the king. Why do we end with the king? Because we're trying to meet the king. But the rabbis tell us, you want to meet the king? You have to be the king. In order to understand God, you have to understand. In in order to connect to God, you have to understand God. How do we learn about the king? What's this whole process? Why does Hashem want us to work on our midot with one another? Because as we discover the sefirot, the character, we get along with one another, God gets revealed to us through relationships. God gets revealed to us through interacting. God gets revealed to us through midot, through Torah, through mitzvot. And once you've gone through this, interacting with one another, and you're perfecting it, or at least you're giving it a chance, all of a sudden you see God. He's not in the Shamaim and he's a faraway being that you can't connect with. You find God in your wife. You find God in your children. You find God in your friends. You find God in nature. You find God in animals, in trees. You find Him everywhere. And when you get to that point, you say, God, I got to know you in 49 days. He says, now let me give you a gift and really reveal myself to you. And that's Matan Torah. Because we said Matan Torah, Matan, comes from the word Matana, gift. Hashem says, work for 49 days. Let me see the work you're going to do. When you're done, I'll give you a gift. The gift of Kedusha. Be'ezat Hashem, we all be, uh, to, all merit to be kings in Hashem's eyes and that we'll merit to make Him king in our life. Amen. Shabbat Shalom, Umebura.